sure people will keep trickling in, but welcome to our sixth conversation in the New Works Regeneration Series. Um, I'm Mae Bartlett. I'm part of the Solvable team along with my colleague Adam Lerner. And we're grateful to be co-hosting this conversation today with Social Gastronomy Movement. Today we get to be in conversation with Nicole Masters, exploring regenerative agriculture. So uh, before we dive in, I just want to acknowledge that we are joining from many places around the world um, and we all inhabit different lands that all have a deep, rich, complex and often traumatic history. So I want to take a moment to acknowledge the land that I get to live on. Um, I live in what is now known as Salt Lake City, Utah, and it is the unceded territory of the Shoshone and Ute tribes. And I want to express my gratitude and privilege and condolences for being able to call this place my home. So I invite each of you to share a land acknowledgement in the chat if that's something that feels meaningful for you. Great, wonderful. So our intentions for this series is to create a space where we get to honor the new works of uh, thought leaders in the field. So that's why we are grateful to have Nicole here with us. It's also a space where you get to learn and connect with peers. Um, we have a lot of people from a lot of different fields and a lot of different backgrounds joining us in this space today. Professionals in agriculture, chefs, gardeners, um, and the works. So this is gonna be a unique space where we get to bring lots of people together uh, through the regenerative agriculture lens. So with that intention, we invite you to, you know, share your knowledge and your wisdom that you bring into this space. We're of course here to learn from Nicole, but we're also here to learn from each other. So you'll have the opportunity to participate in breakout groups and get to know each other a little bit more and learn from each other just as much as from Nicole. So please don't hold back. Um, you will also have an opportunity toward the end today to ask questions directly to Nicole or share any insights or thoughts that feel important. So make sure that you think of those as you know, as you learn and as you um, dive into this topic more. Um, another intention for this space is that we hope that we've designed the conversation in a way that, you know, opens up your perspective and offers new insights and ways of thinking about things so that you leave with new knowledge and, and a little bit of a new way of being when it comes to regeneration and specifically regenerative agriculture. Okay, so before we uh, dive in and I turn it over to the rest of the team and Nicole, I'm going to lead us through a brief presencing exercise. So, so get comfortable in your chair. Go ahead and close your eyes if that feels okay for you, or you can just keep a soft gaze at the floor. And bring your awareness to your body, letting the outside world melt away. See if you can feel into the sensations of your skin. Can you feel any tingling in your hands or in your feet? And tune in a bit deeper to see if you can feel into your muscles. How about your bones? What do your bones feel like in this moment? Can you feel into the elementary particles that make up your body? The same elementary particles that make up the rest of the earth. Your body is mainly made up of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. And these are the same elementary particles that make up 
the soil in which we grow our food and that make up the very food that you eat. So just take a moment to sit with the knowing that you're made up of the very same particles that make up the entire world around you. And that come from the same source billions of years ago with the birth of the universe. Bring your awareness back to the physical sensations in your body. And what does your body feel like in this moment? Does it feel any different with the remembering of the particles that make it up? And as you're ready, you can open your eyes and rejoin the room. Okay, so now you are going to have the opportunity to go into a brief breakout room with two other people in the space as a chance to get to know some other people on a more personal level. You'll have about 10 minutes together and your prompt is just to introduce yourself and share what draws you to this topic of regenerative agriculture. I hope you had a good discussion in your breakout room and got to meet some interesting people. We will be coming back to those breakout rooms for a discussion after the conversation uh, with, with Nicole. Uh, so that was just a general intros. If there was anything that particularly showed up in your conversation that you want to share or how you know, what, what's bringing you to this conversation around a regenerative agriculture, please do share that in the chat. We are very pleased to be co-hosting this conversation with an organization uh, based out of Brazil, but really a gro global organization named the Social Gastronomy Movement. And they are dear friends and our, our colleague and teammate, Charles Holmes, has been working with them for years. Uh, we are excited about bringing their work into this space as well as their, their perspectives in building the movement. And I'd just like to, Nikki, if you wanted to share a little intro about Social Gastronomy and the movement that you're building welcome you in. Thank you and hi everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon. I think we're literally across the globe from what I've already experienced only in our little breakout room. Um, so the Social Gastronomy Movement is a global network of local communities, so basically change makers from around the world and it's really across the entire food cycle because it's all interconnected. Like if we don't connect the dots, we're not actually going to um, address um, the food system that we have in front of us. And so collectively uh, with these change makers that can be um, from farmers, like we just met Mark, <laughs> to, to chefs, to social entrepreneurs, anyone that really identifies with food for social change, which is what social gastronomy stands for, um, is part of the movement. And we're collectively working towards a more just and equitable food system where no one gets left behind. And so um, practically we do that by building a community, this global community, so that that can trickle down into local communities as well. So the sense of belonging through connecting between us, because it always starts with that connection. And um, then we discover a little bit more and start working towards shared goals. So I hope that there will be opportunity as well to go deeper, um, connecting a few people that are here today um, to go deeper into the topic of what Nicole is gonna bring to us of regenerative agriculture. And lastly, partnerships. So it's connections, collaborations, and partnerships where we do share responsibility uh, towards the systems change that we want to see. And so I'm very excited to be here to, um, to co-host and to listen and learn with all of you. And uh, Nicole as well, I'm grateful that you accepted our invitation. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. Uh, this truly is a global community as you probably are getting the sense through looking around the room and the conversations that you've had and which is incredibly powerful and the opportunity to use Zoom as a way to be able to connect with each other and be able to connect with the localized uh, agro systems across the world and bring it together into a larger conversation is a real privilege. 
for we were very uh, both Nikki and uh, and May and myself were really struck by the the work of Nicole Masters, who has been uh, at this. I think she can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like for the better part of a couple of decades in her regeneration journey. And uh, she wrote a, a really beautiful book called uh, For the Love of the Soil. And, uh, and we'd like to uh, be able to speak with Nicole specifically about some of her pieces of her journey, um, what she's learning in all of her practical work with, uh, with farmers, uh, ranchers uh, across the world, and even in some in education. And I'll just share a brief introduction to, for Nicole in case you're not familiar with her. She's an agroecologist, an educator, and a systems thinker, uh, and she works across Australasia and North America. In fact, she's, uh, she's now calling in from Montana, I think, working on regenerative land practices. As a self-proclaimed soil geek, Nicole has been working as a soils coach to agricultural producers through her organization, Integrity Soils. In diverse production sectors from dairy, sheep, and beef, viticulture, compost, nurseries, market, gardens, racing studs, lifestyle blocks to large scale cropping. We were particularly uh, drawn into this conversation because of uh, Nicole's ability to think about the many manifestations of what regenerative agriculture means, not just in land, but the human relationship to land. I'd also like to invite uh, Mike to join me from SGM is co-hosting this conversation with Nicole. And uh, welcome Nicole. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's um it's quite overwhelming sometimes to hear an introduction and then see the incredible diversity of people that are in on this call. And I think quite a few of you could actually be leading this right now, not just me. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Um, so Mike, do you want to start out with the first question? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike I'm from the Social Gastronomy Movement. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the session. So as Adam mentioned, we're going to try to discover a little bit of that regeneration path or journey that Nicole has been, has been doing. Nicole, are you there with us? I just want to double check because... It froze. Yeah. yeah? It, yeah? I just got a, a crash report from Zoom, <laughs> so I'm not sure if it's Zoom okay. or that is that is the issue we talk about connectivity for a lot of people that are involved in food production in rural areas have this issue with work you know internet connectivity so the world feels very connected but at the same time the people that we need to be involving in this conversation uh, struggle to have good broadband or internet yeah yeah uh so i would like to start asking you about your regeneration journey and what regeneration has come to mean to you? Because, you know, there's a lot of definitions right now and regeneration is just becoming like a super mainstream term. So I just wanna hear from you, how, how was your regeneration journey and what that means to you? Mm, those are always such big questions and I feel like sometimes I cover, <laughs> get sick of hearing my own voice, but, um, I think for me, it's always been a very early concern. Like my, I didn't grow up in farming. You know, I had farming aunties and uncles and we had that around us, but my father and my grandfather were actually pilots um, in the Royal New Zealand Air Force. And I spent a lot of time in aircraft looking down. And I think that that bird's eye view gave me a different perspective, I think, then other five and six year olds was that chance to kind of look down and New Zealand has a lot of erosion and just being really really concerned about erosion from some of my earliest memories of just looking at these big scars and thinking is is the, it was like the land was bleeding you know having that whole sense of like what are we doing um but yeah I, I studied ecology and I majored in soil science and that was kind of my my science tilt on it and I um I left university and I was managing community gardens and we we were given some land to set up a community garden in the middle of a low socioeconomic area um, and the community itself didn't want the gardens they hadn't asked for them so we dealt a lot with vandalism and people just coming along and pulling all the plants out and tipping all the seed trays out and it, it was really devastating 
And at the same time, it was this realization of we don't put change on top of people. We don't say, hey, this is how it needs to go and you need to be eating good quality food. And um, and so I think that I was 25. It was a really striking lesson in terms of, yeah, how do we bring health and, and resilience into systems without trying to force it upon people? Um, yeah, and I did start out in organics. I was the... I think I was the youngest co-chair for the Soil and Health Association in New Zealand. Um, maybe I was 28 years old and was working in organics and just really feeling like there was a, a breakdown in the mindset around looking after soil and ecosystem services that was focusing more on marketing and focusing more on these are the things thou shalt not do and these are the things thou shalt do and seeing soil system deteriorate. And I was working in the pip fruit industry in New Zealand as, as, it, as it began to collapse. So they were cultivating the ground to try and deal with an insect problem and the whole system fell apart. And within about a year after that, the industry went from about 30 major producers down to two um, growing organic pip fruit. So I I've had some really like dramatic lessons in terms of how do we start to look at systems as a whole? And for me, that's where the regeneration part is. And again, it's just a label, like we're just finding names. We're trying to, especially I think in Western cultures, we so want to name and isolate and have something be separate. And, you know, this is regenerative and this is organic and this is conventional. I mean, and we can't really frame, I mean, what does it mean to be conventional? No, you know, there's no definition for that. Yet we run round and round in circles trying to define regenerative and We've been, I feel like this conversation for so long, trying to term, what are we going to call this? Um, we decided not to call it regenerative agriculture in New Zealand in 2008 because it felt like such a mouthful of a word as well. So we, we went down the track of calling it biological agriculture and that backfired a little bit because the agronomists were like, everything's biological. So which is true, you know, there's biology in every system. So yeah, for me, there is that, that struggle around, you know, how do we name things when what we're naming is a mindset, what we're naming is an attitude, what we're naming is a world of being, go and put a name on that. Good luck. <laughs> I think that's a really interesting context because many of us, I, well, for those of us who are not ab, ab, like intertwined into agricultural production in our work. Um, organics was the onboarding for many of us to begin thinking about that, but it also became an overly simplistic kind of checkbox that was, you know, through the certification process of this was or was not an organic without the recognition, I think that you're talking about, which is really the kind of movement behind it in the, in terms of the, the consciousness shift and the worldview shift. And I'm really, it's one of the spaces that we spend a lot of time working in, which is to really nuance a lot of these questions of where we have labels and definitions and categories. And the reason that we're doing this regeneration conversation broadly is to look at many different lenses of regeneration. And I'm, I'm really curious how you see um, this in your work and manifesting these, uh, the building of, um, of nuance and perspective and maybe even sitting with some of the challenges and paradoxes as the, of those who are kind of in the process of shifting or may have already shifted and still recognize that the some of the challenges uh, or insufficiency of even some of the work that they might be doing despite their best intentions. Yeah, I think there was like 10 questions in there, Adam, but, <laughs> well, 10 points are really powerful. Um, I stopped consulting last June and July. So we're focusing predominantly on coaching the coaches right now and, and educational side. But before we, we kind of put that aside, my average client size was about 10,000 acres. And so you're working with producers that are sometimes early in this transition. They're seeing, hey, the current system really isn't working. You know, inputs are going up, stress is going up. Um, the, you can see the soil losses, you can see, you know, soils are getting harder, it's getting dry, you know, all of these effects that are happening on producers. So there's this increasing pressure on people to change practices. And it's often the practice that'll be the first thing that starts to come in. So when I start working with somebody, it might be, yeah, we're going to be looking at a practice and it might be, let's buffer some of your chemicals or can we 
can we switch out some of those really toxic chemicals for something that's going to be less harmful um, and then start to build those observations so farmers and ranchers have extraordinary observations that they've been making for decades but not necessarily the space to bounce it in terms of well what does that mean and and when people start to dig into i wonder why the answers are already there in themselves they know that well actually this kind of season happened or i was out there too early when it was wet and i actually created the conditions for this specific weed or um, I've been monoculture after monoculture, and that's why these insects are starting to come in. And so that's the doorways I find as we start to um, delve into, I wonder why. And it's that critical thinking that's such a huge piece of regenerative agriculture, which why is why it seems so hard, because we've we've tried to dumb all the systems down from education to health to, to farming is um, don't think this is the calendar. This is the thing you're going to put on. If you're not sure the answers, you know, this chemical, this, this solution um, and that it can actually feel kind of scary to say, all right, we don't have all the answers and, and let's work it out for you on your specific piece of land and start to work out what's going to work well for you. Um, and I mean, I've had some pretty good success, but I can imagine for some producers that would be terrifying. You mean I don't? You don't just tell me what to do? No, I'm not going to tell you what to do. No one's got the answer for you. You're an individual, and we've stopped treating people like they're individuals. You're just the mass machine, the industrial model to you know pump out something fairly average at the other end. But I think I tapped into one or two of your points, Adam. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, you're bringing up some of the cultural pieces, which is the, which are the, when I think about agriculture production, especially if we think of it at the producer level, is there's, there's such a, there's already so much uncertainty. Uh, and so you introducing, you know, another uncertainty, you know, there's, it seems like there's been this kind of desire, as there are in many fields, in order to create um, de-risk scenarios by introducing certain elements that seem quite prescriptive, even if we understand the long-term implications are damaging. But there's also that for many of the producers still, some of this, you know, they've been working in a multi-generational context. So these are, you know, you have, you have a cultural context that they may have been raised in that now they're on the next second or third or fourth generation of in producing. And I'm interested in how you, um, help um, overcome or um, un unfurl some of those mindset shifts that are really culturally entrenched um, and that could be even very personal to kind of family relationships mm -hmm. in agriculture. Mm. And it's such a good point what you're making, Adam, around this, this concept of uncertainty. Agriculture is uncertainty and we've made that somehow wrong we've made that somehow we have to control as many of these uncertain factors um, and as a result there's all the unintended consequences of I'm going to try and prevent this um, and I'm going to put this spray on without thinking actually that's leading to like if we were to consider just neonicotinoids so one of the most common insecticides that's used it alters 600 genes in that plant and those genes are responsible for things like um, disease resistance and other types of um, plant health aspect. And it's like, we're so busy trying to control uncertainty, we create more uncertainty. So a big part of this mindset training is it's okay. It's learning how to be okay with uncertainty. That actually, that's the one thing we can be certain of is there is gonna be uncertainty. We don't know what's happening with the next season. We don't know what's happening with marketplaces. Um, and so I think um, learning how to, how to be more secure in yourselves around not being concerned people are going to drive up your driveway and tell you that the sky is falling and you should panic and you need to put this on and there's a lot of that pressure happening um you know across fence lines oh there's this pest coming you better spray even though you don't have that pest yet and i think the more that we can empower people and their ability to do that critical thinking it helps with that uncertainty piece um, because although that was the promise of the green revolution it's not true it's actually increased uncertainty not decreased it Yeah, thank you, Nicole. I have a, I have another question here uh, related to food security because you know food security is a huge problem right now in 
I think COVID as well just increased the gap between food security in different countries and different regions. And if we shift to regenerative agriculture, for example, that might be a way to locally, I would say locally, local communities uh, being practicing regenerative agriculture and moving and helping to solve like food security in their locals. Do you have an example of that that you can demonstrate to us? Yeah, and I think many of you would have had this experience in the last two years, the incredible slap around the chops that COVID provided to say, hey, these systems are broken, deeply, deeply broken. And one example I can think of was actually in South Dakota um, on reservations there and also the um, reservations here in Montana was they were the last ones to have food bank supplies. They're the last one on the supply chain and suddenly there's no access to, to, to some of those food chains. There was nothing in the grocery stores and what they realized was 100% of the beef that was being produced locally was being exported on the commodity market off the reservations and it's like here we are growing some of the most beautiful beef products and it's not being sold to tribal members. And now seeing that um, connection with people starting to realize, hey, we do grow food in these areas and how do we set up local production systems for that and take all the middlemen out and actually those systems are more profitable in that space. And for me, that that's really exciting because a lot of this food security issues we're dealing with is supply chain and moving food around as opposed to people being unable to grow their own food in these regions you know and I'm meeting more and more people that are now like here in Montana you know producing food all year round which is something people have forgotten that they could do so the excitement of like yes we can actually grow food in these areas We have we have we haven't seen also a lot of loss of biodiversity during the last two years, specifically here, like in South America, in Amazon, and regenerative agriculture is becoming like a proxy or a preach for the companies and agro companies. And I would like to hear your opinion about the 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 role of the big players and the agro on regenerative agriculture, regenerative shifting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the major players play uh, an important role in this whole process. This is not, hey, we're all going to go small scale and we're all going to grow our own food in our own backyards and the big companies are going to go away. Um, I can't imagine the world where that would where that would be happening. So really, for me, it's um, I'm interested in training those organizations and working with those organizations in terms of how do we start to look at whole systems approaches? How do we start closing the loops? How do you start giving more back into communities rather than um, the exploitive model right now and thinking about equity, thinking about justice, thinking about every single part of that regeneration is not just, hey, I planted a cover crop and I'm regenerative um, because that that's just not going to cut it. And I think there's a lot of consumers that are becoming very wary and probably a little tired of those kind of stories. And it's like, no, you don't just get to stamp something unless you're truly living and breathing every part of what is it, what's required to regenerate communities, what's it required to, 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 to produce food, you know? And I look here in this American system, a lot of that food production is not actually for human food, you know, think about corn. So starting to think, how do we, how do we support local communities instead of having systems that don't need people, which is where, we're, where we've been heading. Well, it's, obviously there's some of the very large food producers, and I think we actually have some of them maybe on this call um, with representatives uh, are moving towards or have expressed a commitment to move towards, uh, towards regenerative practices. Uh, and um, how do you see at a system scale um, regeneration playing out with the relationship between the kind of local uh, small production and the large um, agra um, producers um, and how I guess forecast you, you kind of from what you see in the systems and how things have changed even in the 20 years you've been wor working in this space how do you see it playing out in this decade I see it playing out really fast because it's already happening in regions really, really quickly. I look at the success of some of the producers and some of them are on this call I see from New Zealand, you know, some of that, um, that 
that that carry off of you see people's successes in communities and uh not making people wrong not being all dogmatic you know there's going to be big and large players um and working to to solve some of these issues within communities i think is is really exciting and i do see that moving quite quickly i think if people are coming in to change some kind of practice without changing the philosophy or the paradigm or the mindset then you are potentially still going to degenerate right because any of these practices could be degenerative or regenerative depending on how you do you know currently i think cover crops in the us 51 percent of them are terminated using glyphosate they're talking about putting millions more of acres into cover crops but without addressing that issue of termination we're just drinking more glyphosate in this country um so yeah i think there's i think we're certainly seeing that drive back to the curiosity about local food and local food systems and quality food. So I think that's going to drive a lot. Yeah. Well, and I think about too, at the layering, cause we work a lot in the climate space. And so I think about how, you know, we've been speaking about food primarily and now, you know, we've now entered the conversation about carbon sequestration. And so you have another market that's been, created or being created on top of what was what configured as a food agricultural system and how do how do you see and there's just as those systems nested systems start to really overlap and we start to see the relationship how does something like viewing uh land and regenerative practices as a commodification around carbon sequestration sequestration change the relationship to uh to the agricultural production there's two parts to it part i want to puke that we are <laughs> sorry that we're commodifying nature and the other part is we should be paying producers for this life support services that they're providing um if that if if you have producers that are not managing their land regeneratively you're going to see flash floods you're going to see um, more droughts. You're going to see impacts on the urban communities, and that might be through climate change, that might be through the humid hazes, that might be through fire and they can't breathe. You know, all of the ways that we're managing land impacts on absolutely everybody. And so these caretakers should be remunerated for building infrastructure. You know, and I, I reflect back to Abe Collins. Um, who's out in Vermont, you know, his kind of take, and they start, they did try to get a project off the ground in Vermont to reward producers for infrastructure development. I am the dam that you don't need to build. I am the bridge you don't need to repair. I'm the levee that doesn't need to be fixed. Um, I'm the health bill you don't need because you're eating good quality food that's not food full of chemicals. So I think we need to figure out where are we currently allocating some of this money? I mean, if we look at um, the insurance that's paid in, in, in the states, those insurances are being paid out for things like frost damage, like flood damage, like drought, and those are all soil related issues. If we start to focus instead on how do we build soil and put that insurance money instead of at the bottom of the cliff, at the top of the cliff and start to build resilience into the system, that's where I think that, that money should be going. Um, I, I have issues with marketplaces just because it's again not the rancher and the farmer that's going to be making this money. Um, I know there was a large company that's moved into Canada that said there's 1.6 trillion dollars to be made off the Canadian um, landscape because of ecosystem services, and those are not going to the farmers. Um, and that doesn't work. We're still in that same model of extraction, except now you've got a marketplace to extract on. Sorry, rant. <laughs> It's great. It's the nuanced perspective that I was hoping that you would bring in because these are uh, these are these are all complicating, I guess, what you <laughs> what you talk about about the mindset shift. So it seems like on the one hand, we have the mindset shift that's that is changing where people, you know, and there was a question that was um, posed by Gabriella in the in the chat, which is a really good one. So as people begin to understand more about um, regenerative agriculture and these systemic relationships, we then now have a, all of a sudden a new market that is created on top of that, that is kind of a regressive system because it is degener degenerative at the same time and kind of is a setback. So it feels like you kind of make making some mindset progress and then you take this 
and then you introduce back the same uh, different framing of the same regen degenerative system that uh, it's further challenging that the, the progress. Yeah. And what's interesting is I see when producers really start to regenerate all of these life support systems and water and you could include carbon in that. Um, they actually don't, then, and I, it's, I do think that this food is worth more, but they don't actually require that handout anymore. Like they're not taking insurance anymore. They're not taking subsidies. Um, I have a producer I was working with this summer. We're in the middle of a massive drought out here and he's looking around and he's like, drought is a man-made issue. I don't have drought. And he didn't, you know, he had grass, you know, up to your knees. He had big fat cows um, is we need yeah, it's it's a complex one, but we've got to be thinking about well, who's financing this, you know, and what's the what's the strings attached? You want to ask something, Mike? If I'll, I'll, I've got lots like, of questions. What are you doing, Mike? <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was I was looking at the chat here, so sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I we have I I want to make like a practical question. We have a a really different audience here so we have people from all over the world we have people work with governments industry farmers chefs like big audience um, where how or how can i start my journey into regeneration what's your tip where where from now different audiences so i want to start to make like my life more regenerative and incentivize like you know companies and people that are around me so where should yeah. i start yeah, it, it's it's a good question, and um, it was interesting on this coach, the coaches school that we're running right now. We had um, an extension agent on that program who teaches regenerative agriculture, and he's like, you know, I teach practices and principles and mindset, and he's like, but I realized I never shifted my own mindset. So really doing a lot of that deep self-development work for ourselves around, am I acting from my deep purpose? Or am I acting on top of something to overcome some inadequacy or something that I have to prove to others or whatever? Because I think if we had a world of people that had done that deep work, we wouldn't be in this situation that we're in right now, quite frankly. Um, so I think it doesn't matter if you are inside a corporation or if you're um, producing your own food in your own backyard, do that work for yourselves because once we align our practices with that core purpose, we are really aligning with nature as far as I'm concerned. And then we're less likely to have these, um, yeah, unintended consequences. That's a good question, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's a lot of, you know, doubts right now, where can we start or how, how can I shift it to regenerative? And that's a good, good answer. Thanks so much. Uh, then we are almost at the time here. I don't know if I have time for another question but um, I would like to stay and chat with Nicole like the whole afternoon, but <laughs> I know we can't. But also I want to hear from the audience. I don't know if anyone have one question, so we can have more time to one question from on the chat, or if you want to make a question, just open your mic and make the question directly. Well, I think um, is people are typing in lots of great questions and thoughts. So yeah. I think what we'll do is, uh, maybe have a couple more minutes here and then we'll have breakouts and then we'll come back and people can share and we'll we'll it'll give a chance for Nicole to go through the chat a bit and then we can have people um, turn on the camera and, and mic and be able to share their question openly. Sure. How, um, I, I do want to ask the question, Nicole, of how you see in in the remuneration piece, if 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 you see that soil health is uh, is very much we can understand a I guess if, if you're a producer, you can understand the responsibility for your 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 health and your well-being for yourself within your community. I guess, and then there's the financial piece that comes into it, which is that you're not necessarily paid for some of those things that are the what would be called externalities in a system that would be you know per what you talk about about you know being the dam or uh, or uh, or being being the um, the a source for greater health. I'm curious about how you see this well-being um, conversation, whether you take it at the farmer level or the community level, becoming a more central part of the of the kind of 
larger conversation around regenerative agriculture. Is there a question in there? Yeah. How do I yeah, well-being. Well well so how do we deal with the cultural conversation around well-being within the context of agriculture? Yeah. Well, I kind of think we have the, I don't want to say perfect storm happening right now, which is uh, we have an example of a pandemic that's racing around the world and everybody reaches for a vaccine. Well, we're not discussing human health and nutrition and what we're breathing in so the effect of smoke and dust and all of that like what other things are, are happening and I think this is the prime time for these conversations to be happening is how does our health link to land management while we have these parched deprived low microbiome gut systems in the soil that are collapsing we're seeing the same thing with human health so I really think that there's no separation between what's happening on the land than what's happening with people and there really is an epidemic with um, the degeneration of soil health and then how is that impacting on everybody globally so it's exciting for me to see things like kiss the ground and some of the other documentaries gather that are on Netflix you know people are now starting to 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 watch more nature documentaries they're starting to watch things and go you know what I need to get out of this apartment building and get into the mountains you know the amount of traffic we saw here in Montana and Colorado this year was insane you know the the rats are fleeing the ship no. <laughs> but you know that idea of people are really deeply feeling like we, re, we we need to be reconnecting and I think that's going to be an outcome of this current state is people shifting their what's important what really is important and what is happening out there why are we covered in dust you know the dust storms this year and uh, here Australia Russia China were massive massive dust storms you know it impacts on people yeah <laughs> John's like sorry for adding to the traffic last summer <laughs> yeah it was good times it's great I think this is a good leaping off point into our breakouts. Um, and so we'd like to uh, have, we're gonna have about 15 minutes for breakouts and you'll be back uh, more or less with the people that were in your original group as much as we can configure that, uh, given that we've had some new people join. And we'd like you to um, talk about as a group, how you can, what you can do to shift your mindset and or practices um, towards regeneration. And particularly given the global nature of this conversation, it would be really great to root your conversation in your localized experience. Because I think that one of the power of this community coming together is that we have so many different experiences uh, within this community based on where people are living. So we'll share the, uh, we'll share the prompt in the chat and really, and you can come at it from whether you're professionally um, in, engaged in the agriculture, in agricultural production, or whether it's really around mindset and practices and consumption. Uh, so we will, uh, we'll share that chat and we, in the chat, and we hope you have a great breakout discussion and we'll come back for everyone to openly share questions after the breakouts. Thank you, Adam. Nicole, I'd be very happy to uh, have a chat with you afterwards, given you we're both New Zealanders. Who's that? It's Kenneth, Kenneth Irons. Oh. I'm, I'm based in Christchurch, New Zealand. I'm chairman of Agritech New Zealand, which is the Agricultural Technology Association for a couple of hundred businesses. And I'm also the New Zealand representative on the International Standards Organization Strategic Advisory Group that is forming a set of new data standards for interoperability uh, across 160 countries represented by 22 nations at a at a, a forum level, and I'm the New Zealand representative on that. So it's a global perspective, um, but it, the, there's very definitely a convergence between traditional farming and large scale operations, uh, but recognizing the real importance of small, small landholders um, mm. and the ability of uh, technology and data interconnectivity to be able to facilitate um, you know, less than a hectare um, uh, properties around the world. As I was just saying in our startup group, we've got about 40,000 farms in New Zealand. The average size is 313 hectares. You go to the other extreme, Yunnan province in China has got 900,000 farms, but their average size is 400 square metres. So th there's a tremendous span of difference there, uh, but the ability of uh, the world food system to be able to operate efficiently in that requires data. Um, 
as one of the com components, but it's I don't believe it's as aligned as it needs to be yet with regenerative. And you're tied in with um, Calm the Farm and Tikoha? No, but I'm I'm sitting across, a, I, I don't work with any individual groups, there's many of them. Um, I obviously am with Agritech and with work I'm doing with the New Zealand government, but um, that's exactly as that, it's trying to not uh, work with any anyone, but to understand the whole and not just the whole in New Zealand. Um, so all of the various initiatives, but not just in any one country. So that's a, a, a fairly high degree of abstraction, um, but it's trying to understand the entire system and then identify the ways in which that cohesion can actually come about, uh, bringing the you know um, corporate farming, major global corporates of which there are about two hundred. Um, mm. How do you, how do you re reconcile that with somebody that's trying to produce a small economic surplus of four hundred square meters in Yunnan province in China? How do you how do you systematize that? And that's my perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Cool. So I guess we start to making connections here. <laughs> uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I would like to hear from the groups and the, the small uh, breakout rooms. What are your takeaways? And also open the mic. That's the opportunity for you to make any questions that you want to Nicole here. So we have a few times. So if you have questions, please just raise your hand and we and open and we're gonna select you to open your mic and make the questions. Or if you if you don't want to open your mic, you can just uh, you can just put on the chat your question. Also put on the chat your reflections that you had or you made during your breakout rooms. So we, we would love to hear from you uh, what that, you know, what emerged in the breakout rooms. Who wants to start? Hi, this is, this is Yuri. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, hello Yuri. Hi. Hello, uh, sorry for the camera. This is Yuri. I work for, I'm the director for corporate responsibility for Cargill in Latin America. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, long time supporter of SASGM, so <laughs> I feel at home. Uh, and Nicole, I, I probably have a billion, a billion dollar question for you, or maybe much more than that, which is how do we promote system changes like this in regenerative agriculture into commodity supply chains, um, which is you know very very um, streamlined. Uh, costs is really a challenge and uh, makes everything much more difficult. It's different. It's different than working you know specialty markets or, or anything like that. But I, I don't know if you have any views around that. Well, most of the clients I work with are in the commodity market already. Um, the issue. Well, what I see is the opportunity, I guess, is there needs to be a value proposition with those more quality, nil residue crops. So you've got producers that are still they're growing corn and soybean, um, but they're intercropping. They might be running cattle on that too. They are increasing the, the nutrient density or the quality of the oil or the whatever other things that they're doing with that food production. And I think that's potentially what the opportunity is, is to go, all right, when well, we have this nutrient dense aspect. What I've seen though, with a lot of the commodity markets is they don't want to differentiate and say, this one's a better quality because it says that the main product is not as good, which um, I think raises issues. Um, but that's where I see there is opportunities to be still niche marketing some of the commodity markets from within that whole system and paying producers for the fact that those products don't waste, they travel better, they store better, um, they taste better, they make better flour, whatever it might be. But I think to get excited about the fact that right now, um, these large scale commodity producers are not making a lot of money. They're not actually as successful as they could be. And it's in everyone's interest that farmers and growers are more successful. And I, and I think that's part of those, the marketplaces to get really curious about how do we ensure farmers are gonna be more successful. But thanks for being on this call, Yuri, that's great. Yeah, I have an, I have another question it's from Ian. Uh, 
Nicole, do you believe regenerative agriculture needs a tie definition in order to decide if a product or practice deserves that accreditation? No, and no, and no. <laughs> in, that, in that question, um, I, I think the people that are going out and marketing themselves and saying that they're regenerative, they need to get clear about what does that mean. And for me, it would be an outcome-based accreditation. There is so much amazing technology like Kenneth was talking about before. Um, we can do satellite imagery now in terms of how much soil losses do you have? How much nitrates are you contributing to, to waterways? Um, there's more sensors coming around in terms of what kind of bird life do you have in your area? You know, I think we're getting, um, I guess, more sensor ability to say that actually this ecosystem is on a, a process of healing. Um, and, and I think the more we focus on those outcomes, if we're going to say that something's regenerative, let the outcomes, because the minute you certify practices, we're back into the, the issue that um, organics got into, which is, hey, you can be an organic greenhouse and still use glyphosate uh, around your greenhouse, you know, and I think um, that that's not regenerating. It's not regenerative at all. Um, you know, and there's so much to this as well, like, I don't, I've never met anyone who's truly regenerative because we're inside a, a degenerative structural system. You know, I drive a 350 Chevrolet to tow my horse trailer. You know, there's nothing regenerative about that. Um, but looking at, all right, there we we are in this process of, of learning and improving ecosystem outcomes. Let's keep building on that. So wherever you're at and whatever your goals are, and those might be personal goals as well, or it might be community goals, or it might be what you're what you're eating for yourself. Um, looking at that whole system is is for me the regenerative part. And then how do you certify it? So I'm interested in the mindset and the philosophy. Uh, and if you don't have that, then and I was your certifying auditor and I was an auditor for a year for organics. I would walk in your house, look in your cupboards and say, no, you're not going to pass. Sorry, buddy. You know, <laughs> which is very judgmental. Um, but yeah, that, that I don't think we're going to get there with a bunch of boxes to tick. We need to be looking at whole systems, regeneration, and then um, starting to get whole catchments, whole communities, whole states, um, looking at, at the impact that this is having. Awesome. More questions here for you. So, Nikki from Kenya, can you please make your question? I know you raised your hand before. Hi, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, so, thank you, Nicole. Uh, my, my, my interest got really piqued when you, um, when you spoke about like regenerative uh, food production in relation to human health, like you spoke about the vaccine and, and what have you. Uh, so really, and I know you don't have a lot of time here, but like to what degree do you relate regenerative agriculture to like human health? Like, could you just speak a bit, like just briefly about that? Because that is, that, is, there is, that is the mindset with which I got into this conversation to just like understand or just like learn more about, okay, so regenerative agriculture and, uh, you know, like, so human health. And so we're in the middle of a pandemic. So how are these related? You know, I love that you're joining us from Kenya. Amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, when I'm working with producers, I relate this all to human health because um, our soil systems have basically got Crohn's disease. You know, there's leaky gut happening out there. Um, we think about inflammation and dehydration, but this gut microbiome is that we have, even living in urban areas, is influenced by the air that you're breathing and the food that you're eating. And so we see huge differences between the gut microbiome of someone that's um, eating a more indigenous diet, that's eating a diversity of foods. And we need the same thing to landscapes. Where's the diversity? Or well, here we are in a monoculture after a monoculture after a monoculture. And it's, it's, it's setting the same scene as it does in the human body is that the microbes that are important to break this thing down are no longer functional um, or the enzymes and the hormones and the secondary metabolites and the vitamins that we need for human health are the same in that soil system. So I talk about plant roots, 
you know, that the plant actually outsources its gut. The gut is the soil and it's the microbiology in that, that soil medium that enables plants to get vitamins, that enables them to get the iron that they need um, and to get the metabolites that they need for defense. So if we undermine that root system, it's the same as what we're doing in the, in the human system. So they're now saying 100% of immunological disorders in the human body relate to gut health. That's anything that relates to inflammation, any allergies, um, autoimmune, um, brain disorders, all sorts of things now they're relating to the, the, the human gut microbiome. So we're seeing the same breakthroughs in the soil microbiome in terms of if you want robust, healthy, resilient plants, it's all about that microbiome. And so the there's, there's a lot of similarities. So we can talk about diversity. We can talk about um, allowing rest and recovery, the things that we don't do for ourselves. Like suddenly humanity is all about, you're a good person because you work really hard and you self-sacrifice and you don't sleep. That means that you're successful. Um, and that's not true. It's how do we look after ourselves and rest? And, and you know, I, I know in some areas in Africa, um, there used to be a process of actually having a fallow period of land like that was encouraged and now we're like we can't have fallow because it's not productive and we're not making money but actually land needs to rest the forest needs to rest and we need to rest um, so for me there's no separation like I, I kind of I love those conversations so thank you oh thank you I have the last question I will ask for I, I kindly ask Jay if you can make the question live, Jay, yeah, are you there? You bet. Yeah, oh, hey, Mike. thank you. Hey, hey, Nicole. So I've got a few colleagues on the on the call today, but I work, uh, I'm a farm journalist in Canada, but I work for the Canola Council of Canada, which is, is the canola crop, rapeseed in Europe, canola in Australia. Anyway, um, we, t we talk a lot about soil health, about biodiversity, carbon sequestration. We just had a webinar last week with the uh, prof from the University of Calgary talking about the benefits of non-farm spaces. He calls them messy spaces within farms and why they're important. Anyway, um, but you know, farmers feel like they're under a lot of pressure from, from everyone else's society, which is the other 98% of the population. Um, so I just wondered if you have advice uh, when it comes to talking to farmers about about this mindset shift, how do you how do you get the conversation going in such a way that that it ends up being fruitful? Um, I gen I mean, I often want to get in the room with people, you know, and and have those conversations about what is it that you really really care about, and and we'll we'll, we'll explore that. You know, people care about their families, and I think everybody does around the world. People care about relationships. They care about stewarding land. They care about leaving a legacy. There's a lot of that deep care and love. But when you look at how do those, how do your ac actions align with that commitment? And what you find is there's a really big gap, and 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 that happens particularly in conventional um, monocultural systems. And you know, you'll find people in those systems. Um, they often won't eat their own food if they are producing any of their own food. Um, but it's like, how do we shrink that gap? Because that's what you're committed to. That's what you love. Um, and so can we trial something? Can we get in communication with other producers that are further along the track to reduce that, that real concern of risk? Because it is a real concern. Um, and this is where I'm seeing the most expansion of regenerative soil activities is with people that have support groups so that they can discuss things. You don't have to learn all of this from scratch. Um, there's people that have been doing this for many, many decades in cropping um, and they don't have to just be in Canada, right? Like to talk to people in Western Australia or talk to people in New Zealand, um, talk to people in Europe and go, what is it that, that you're doing that I can put into my system that's gonna enable me to slightly cut back on this one thing that I know doesn't align with what I care about. I know it's really bad for my health. I know it's bad for my family's health. Um, and is there something we can substitute? And, and that's kind of, I don't, we don't say this to everybody in public, but we talk about the methadone program, right? So if we're gonna get on that methadone program um, and just to wean off some of those more addictive inputs, especially right now with the cost of everything, um, what is it that we can substitute and without dropping yield? Because right now yield is the gold standard instead of profitability. And that's part of the mindset change is 
do you farm for yield? And they do, you know, you go down to the pub and you talk about yield instead of um, the reduction in other inputs or, I mean, no one's going to swing their profit around, even though that is actually the measure of success. But um, how do we start to, sh to change some of those conversations? Because you having the biggest yield doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't. Um, so I think there's so many levels today and it's such a big question of yeah. how do we, how do we even start? But can so, I try and connect producers to producers, right? So introduce them to someone that's much further along the track. They can just, that they, that they respect. That's excellent. I love that idea of, of using like, you know, large scale modern kind of farms who have started to adopt some of these because I, I feel like our, my farmers can, can relate better to that. But I'm going to put my email in the chat because we won't be able to talk about any more of this today. But but uh, if, if people around the world have have farmers that you might think I, I'd enjoy chatting with, um, if you could connect me with them, that'd be great. Thanks. I would love to be aligned. Um, Carla says, I don't understand the comment that conventional farmers, can I just reply to that, Mike, uh, won't or don't eat their own food. Um, so from I, I have lived in um, the middle of fairly conservative farming and cropping areas for m most of my life now. And what I found is people would come to us to buy lamb. They would come to us to um, buy eggs. They would come to us to get... Um, vegetables or, or whatever but these were lamb producers themselves but they would come and buy lamb off us because it, well, it tasted amazing obviously um but it's interesting is that you'll find um depending on what they're growing you know if you're growing just corn and soy they're probably not going to be eating those products either it's like you're growing all of this food yet it's not food that you're going to eat for yourself and i think that's kind of an interesting conundrum thank you Nicole, so I know that there's um, still lots of questions, and I don't know if you have time to stay on for a few minutes after, Nicole. Um, so maybe if you do, maybe what we'll do is we'll offer kind of in uh, to respect everybody's time and that people have a cutoff and have to do other things. Um, we'll go ahead and move towards our close over the next five to seven minutes. And then if people who do have additional questions and can stay and Nicole can too, then we can keep the we can keep the space open as a group. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. I think you've been an incredible advocate for the principles of connecting from self to community to, to system. And, um, and I think that there's uh, so much of what you shared, I think resonates with um, so many people on this call and obviously beyond. You both, uh, uh, Nicole through Integrity Soils and, and, and Mike and the uh, Social Gastronomy team are leading incredible change in your own, uh, in your own efforts. I wondered if either of you um, had, uh, both of you had invitations that you wanted to share uh, with the group before we move to a close. So Nicole, is there anything you wanted to invite others to do? Um, I think I put that film to which we belong up. I also have a series of online courses. So if people are interested in kind of learning more of the practical how to feel, smell, you know, get into the, the practical soil side, as well as a masterclass on thinking about nutrition um, in, in food and food growing systems. Uh, and also, if you know anyone that is doing an incredible job with regeneration and is now able to is in the situation where they want to start coaching or consulting, then let them get in touch with me about the next school. The school will be run in July this year. So we'd, we'd love to broaden people that know about the, the program. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Mike? Hello, everyone. Again, so I want to invite everyone here to join the social gastronomy movement. We are a global network of grassroots organizations, chefs, academics, farmers, innovators. So please join us, enter our website, subscribe, give your, uh, your, your contact details and we'll get in touch and invite you to one onboarding so you can become part of our community. So please feel free to join and spread also to friends and whatever you want to, whatever you think could be part of the movement. So everyone is welcome. Thank you both.
And on behalf of myself and May uh, and the Solvable team, we want to thank everybody for the contributions. These are all voluntary efforts, uh, Nicole and the SGM team, and we've spent hours preparing for these conversations because we all are at convinced that we need more of these dialogic spaces to be able to sit with the challenges and paradoxes uh, that sit with the kind of systems change that we all hope to see in the world. These containers are often difficult and challenging to, um, to uh, convene. And what makes it so worthwhile is not just the spaces of the conversation that we're able to lead, but everything that everyone brought into this, uh, into this community. And it was an incredible gift to, to feel that. Uh, I do want to invite uh -huh. everyone to please share, we will share this uh, recording in the uh, by early next week. I invite you to um, to share that with a couple of others in your network who you think could really benefit from some of the content here. And then I also want to invite everyone, and I'll I'll drop the um, link in the chat to join. We have two more conversations left in this series. The next one is on February third with the incredible uh, Colombian okay. academic. Uh, uh, Arturo Escobar, and that's going to be in partnership with the RSA. And actually, Josie Warden is here, I think, on this call too, um, from the RSA. And that's going to be on regenerative design. And that is an incredible um, conversation about the, the decolonization of design uh, and what design practice might look like as we emerge into a, a post colonial era. And then we'll also be together with Rebecca Henderson to talk about regenerative leadership on uh, from the Harvard Business School professor on February the 16th. Everyone is invited to those conversations and I'll include links uh, very shortly. May, I uh, turn it over to you now. Uh, one of the things that May and I talked about is that we, um, we talked about the value of potentially in a little bit of integration that enables us before we go off into the rest of our days or go to bed, depending on where you are in the world, um, that we offer a little bit of integration of all that we've experienced today. So I turn it over to May to close. And then, uh, and then for those of you who would like to stick around for a few minutes, if Nicole can, please uh, feel free to stay on. Thanks, Adam. Okay, everyone, just take a moment to settle back into yourself. Uh, once again, go ahead and close your eyes. Tune into how you're feeling at the end of this conversation. Notice how your body feels. Does it feel the same or different from when you started? What's standing out for you from this time that we've had together? Any new learnings rattling around in there? Any new physical sensations or thoughts? And just ask yourself if there was one thing that you wanna make sure you take away from this conversation today, what would it be? And as you open your eyes and go out through the rest of your day or to sleep, try and take that learning with you and see how you can bring it into your life outside of this space. Thank you, everyone. This has been very wonderful.